Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. This podcast contains adult content. Some of the themes or topics may include information on murder, kidnapping, torture, dismemberment, maybe some demonic content with information on positions and paranormal activity. This podcast will also include explicit, horrible and foul, socially unacceptable, totally uninhibited adult themes language. So if you're easily offended, if you're easily triggered, then I highly suggest you turn this off now. And if not, just keep in mind, parental discretion is advised. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Mysterious Circumstances, and I have my good friend, Deputy X, back with me, and we are going to be talking about the 1988 murder of Lester Garnier out of San Francisco Police Department, and obviously, I got to have Deputy X on for anything related to cops. How you been, man? Good. Doing work and coming home and, you know, surviving the crazy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah trying to survive the apocalypse man you know so without giving away too much when you started looking into this case what did you you know what were your initial thoughts on it uh initially without giving too much away that's that's tough man <laughs> so, <laughs> it really is yeah <laughs> the first thing i pulled up i was like he got into something he shouldn't have and got and got killed for it you know that's what i'm leaning towards i mean there's not a ton of information out there on this case, so it wasn't like when we went over Sean Drenth, we had some really good insider information. Oh, and, of course. Uh, so whatever's out on the public press is all we've got on this. So so I guess we'll go ahead and start off. Uh, Lester Garnier was a 30-year-old undercover vice cop with the San Francisco Police Department. He lived in Concord. He had been on the force since 1980, and he was transferred to vice in 1984 and for some people who might not understand the concept of vice can you kind of give us a little bit little in-depth understanding on that oh man that's the ghost squad that's the the cool kids you know they go (laughs) undercover they work different units our agency mostly deals with narcotics on uh what would you consider a uh, vice squad but there's i mean there's all different types out there there's auto theft vice teams there's uh narcotics prostitution there's even some that deal with embezzlement and corruption in big business they have vice squads for that stuff and i don't remember where the original term came from but it's just it's your ghost guys you'd never think they were actually cops until an arrest gets made totally makes sense especially in the, in this scenario with uh with the prostitution vice and stuff like that so so far, limited information on this case. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of information out there, but it's all the same. It's just on different sites. And this, this was an episode of Unsolved Mysteries at one point in time, too. One of my favorite shows growing up. Personally, I don't remember this episode. But for the most part, Lester was really good at his job, man. He was liked by everyone. He was a good-looking and charming guy. 
He was perfect for posing as a customer for sex workers from a lot of the sources that I read. And it's funny because according to uh, the wiki page for Unsolved Mysteries, they straight up said they're like, even after he would bust prostitutes, they would still speak very, very highly of the guy. You know, they just liked him because he was just a super charming guy, which I thought I kind of chuckled at that. I was like, huh, like you probably don't run across that too often. You know, he was an honest cop. He was known as a very honest cop. Um, He was very by the book. He wanted to eventually transfer into a narcotics vice and uh, in order to you know, buy his new house. He had just recently bought a house in Concord and had a 1984 Corvette. You know, some people look at things like that and they're like, how did he afford all that on a cop salary? He actually worked quite a few part-time security jobs as well on the side. So he was a hardworking guy. And when he did buy that house in Concord, he moved his parents in with him as well, which I thought was, was pretty awesome. Where we start getting it, into our story is on the evening of July 10th, 1988. He is at his home having dinner with his parents and he receives two phone calls that night. His father answered one of those phone calls and said that it was a female. He didn't really hear what they were talking about afterward. And he says, according to his father, he does not know who the other caller was, even whether it was male or female. At about 8.45 p.m., he leaves home, and he's planning to meet up with a friend of his to go watch a movie. At 9 p.m., he calls that same friend from his car phone and says he's running late and can't make it to the movie and never gives a reason why. A little later that night, his friend tries calling him on that car phone, and he said that he did not get an answer. That brings us to 10.45 p.m. Witnesses see his car in Walnut Creek Shopping Center in Walnut Creek, California. A carpet layer from a nearby store goes out to his truck, and he hears two loud sounds, and he said that they sounded like firecrackers. And since it was close to the 4th of July, it was like the week after, he really didn't think much of it. And a few seconds later, he says... He saw two blonde women walking through the parking lot, and they get into separate vehicles and leave. He says one looks like she's in her late 20s. The other one looks like she's in her mid-30s. One of them gets into a faded blue Toyota pickup truck, and the other one gets into a white or gray car, which was either a Toyota or Datsun. There's also a second witness right around the same time frame that says while he was driving through the parking lot, he sees a blonde getting out of the passenger side of a 1984 blue Corvette, which was Lester's car. She walked around the vehicle, looks through the driver's side window, and then walks away. Now, they ended up hypnotizing the second witness, and from this this whole thing, they get a composite sketch of the woman that he saw. And the sketch was shown to the first witness who was the carpet layer. And he couldn't confirm a hundred percent, but he said it looked a lot like the shorter of the two women that he saw that same night. So there is a little bit of corroboration. And just as a cop, I have to ask this question. What do you think about the whole getting hypnotized in composite sketches and stuff. I mean, in this case, in all honesty, when we get further down the story, you're going to see that the composite sketch does ma- does match the, the main suspect. It's a pretty close resemblance. But as a cop, have you ever been witness to anything of that nature, you know, in today's no. law enforcement? Uh, no, I haven't directly, but I have, I mean, I've I've heard, And I've seen some studies on, you know, the hypnosis and uh, being able to, when you're asleep, basically, when they hypnotize you, they basically put you to sleep and then they they work with you. And uh, it's amazing what the subconscious can do and remember that the forefront of your brain won't produce while you're awake. Um, I've never seen it firsthand. I would I'd like to, but I think. It's a heck of a tool, man. Like, 
it's got a lot of research to back it up. So I'm, okay. I'm all for it. I was, I was kind of eager to ask you that question. That was one of those questions. I was like, man, I'm kind of, I, I really want to know your opinion on it or whether you've seen it firsthand or not, but that's kind of awesome that you kind of gave us a little bit of validity to that stuff. That's cool. So on a uh, July 11th at 9 AM, the very following morning, the following morning, a groundskeeper sees a 1984 blue Corvette in the parking lot of Walnut Creek shopping center. They see a guy slumped over in the driver's seat, and they initially think that he's sleeping. And as it turns out, this is Lester Garnier, and he was shot twice at close range, once in the stomach and once in the head. And it is unknown why he was even at that shopping center. I tried looking for, we had talked about this before recording, I couldn't find any kind of information on like bullet trajectory or whether, you know, the shot to the head came from the side or the back. I did read a lot of things that said it was execution style, but being a 1984 Corvette, unless he was already slumped over from the first shot in the gut, I'm not a hundred percent sure how they would say that was execution style. You know what I'm saying? What do do you think about that? Well, that's, that's what really intrigued me. Right. Cause I was like, Oh, execution style. Like I got to see the trajectory on this. Cause you know, the, the car, the Corvette, it's a low profile car. It's got a low roof on it. You know, in 1984, that thing was aerodynamic as they could get it. The premier American made sports car. So to and it's speak. a two seater, uh, right? Yeah. Two seater. I mean, unless there was a bullet hole through the back window into the back of his head, it just execution style didn't really make sense when I was looking at it. And then I looked at some of the content that's available from old news clips, video content anyway, from some of the old news articles. And I just, you don't see any bullet holes in the car. So it's like, okay, well, how close was this person to him? Where did they, where did they make contact with him? And, and which way did that bullet go in to be considered execution style? Now, I mean, the fact that they shot him in the head, maybe that's how they were referencing it as execution style, that he was mm-hmm. shot in the head. But when I think execution style, I think somebody put a gun to the back of somebody's head and and they they pulled the trigger, you know? That's Yeah, that's exactly what I think when I see or hear that too, man. They found his badge and wallet in the glove box. His car keys were missing. And he owned two guns, and even when he was off duty, he usually carried one. But that particular night, he had left both at home. The Corvette was also parked across three parking spaces, and I was really hoping you could confirm this. And from what I have read, they usually, a lot of cops, when they're meeting somebody, they will park this way so that someone else can't sneak up and basically get the jump on them. And then he had his parking lights on as well. Is that fairly accurate, you know, parking across three parking spots like that? Well, I mean, and you don't want people parking next to you because you don't want them making like it harder for you to get it maybe? out. Okay. Well, yeah, you know, you know, like when you go to Walmart or whatever and, and you pull into a spot, like mm-hmm. some people park tighter to the right or to the left, and it it limits your ability to open the doors all the way sometimes. You know, you people park mm-hmm. too close. So if you, if you park like a jackass and you take <laughs> up three spots, you know, nobody's going to pull up and park next to your doors. They're going to park away from you because they're like, Oh, look at this idiot. I'm going to go yeah. down here. And park. <laughs> That's very you know? true, man. If you, if you look back historically, like 10 years ago, if somebody parked sideways like that in three spots, people parked away from them, you know, yeah, definitely. So when you pull up to meet with somebody, you know, even if it's another, another cop, when we do paperwork relays or prisoner transports, like we pull into a parking lot or something somewhere to meet the other person, we don't pull up and park like a normal person. We take up a couple spots to keep other people away from us. And we usually park further away from the businesses so we're not interfering with the day-to-day operations of that business, too. So Yeah, that makes sense. Know. All right, so at the scene, there was, and I tried verifying this, and, and everywhere that I read, it said there was one bullet casing found at the scene. Not two, just one. And it was from an AMT 380 pistol. And this is commonly used at the time, at least, 
as a backup for cops. There were, from what I understand, at least 10 officers who owned that kind of gun on that police force. They all submitted their weapons for ballistics testing. Absolutely none of them matched the murder weapon. And they even went and found there was a couple of female cops who resembled the description that was given and resembled the composite sketch, and they were questioned. But none were ever actual suspects. They never raised any red flags or anything like that. The one bullet casing that was found at the scene when somebody is shot twice, I tried looking for any information that said there was two bullet casings. I couldn't find anything. I thought that was kind of interesting, man. Do you have any thoughts on that as well? Well, I do have a thought on that, and I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't see anything about that when I was doing my research. I did see the, about, the part about the AMT 380 pistols and that a lot of the, the San Francisco department had used them as backup weapons, but my only thought on that is is maybe they were hand loads or cheaper ammunition, so they had maybe that second one had a, the casing powder was maybe lower because quality control and stuff back then for mass produced ammunitions and even today still there's occasionally you'll have a problem and they won't eject the second round. Hmm. Um, in this case, well, the second round is the one that's in question here because there was only one casing found. So either the casing ejected and ended up somewhere, it just never was located again, or it never ejected out of the gun. And that's why they couldn't find it. We could go down the rabbit hole of ammunition <laughs> and casings and primers and, it's plausible that yeah. the second shot, especially if there was no exit wound, right? Like, so if neither one of the bullet holes had a, you know, they have an entry wound, obviously, but if neither one of them had an exit wound, it's a possibility that they were loaded with less powder, powder. than yeah. a normal casing so that they don't exit both sides. Because it's a 380. I don't know if you've ever shot a 380, but that's a oh, pretty... Yeah. That's a pretty powerful little little pistol for. I honestly, you know, I, I I'm a 380 fan. I'm a 380 fan, dude. I love them little things, man. And they're so. I mean, you want to talk about a concealed concealed weapon? Hell, you can put one of those in your front pocket half the time, and now, and you know, that's the that's the old saying, man. It's the little 380 is a pocket gun, you know. Yeah, little gut it, it buster, was called, man. It was called that for yeah. It's called that for a reason, man. You slip it in your pocket and super discreet no matter what you're wearing and off you go for those listeners who are not familiar with the 380 pistol first of all an amt is is fairly rare from what i understand but a 380 pistol if you put out your hand and open it up with your fingers closed against each other a 380 is it's smaller than that you know depending on what brand you buy it's a very very discreet small pistol but them little things get the job done and they're they're made for close range you know they you don't want to you know go to the range with a 380 you know and try to shoot 50 yards down you know but at the same time for personal protection and especially as a cop side piece for law enforcement for a side piece you know you can put one in your boot you can put one in the side of your shoe you know your front pocket pretty much anything and but yeah i, I thought that was interesting that that it was that particular pistol, but the the cops that owned that pistol that were on the force, none of them matched the uh, the ballistics. But that's pretty much the details that we have about this guy's death. That's pretty much it. Personally, I would have liked to know if the back window was broken out because that small of a car. I just really want to know where the entry wounds exactly are, especially the headshot, because you have two people on the scene and, you know, one is seen getting out of the passenger side and going around the car and looking in the driver's side window. It's odd to me, like, why would there have been two people? I mean, we can kind of get into that when we get into the theories, because this guy was... He wasn't involved in some shit, but he brought down a couple people that one of which was pretty prominent politician in town. You know, it's just super, super odd, man. But uh, another another fact that we should know is after Lester's death, a surveillance videotape that was hidden in the office of his house was confiscated 
by local law enforcement, and nobody knows what's on that tape. And some people say that it was footage from a stakeout. Like I said, we really don't know. That's from sources or rumors. It's not confirmed information. But we do know that a videotape was confiscated, and we do not know what was on it. I thought that was kind of interesting. And that, that information came from his, uh, from his parents who lived with him. But they went back and they looked over his past, and there's really not much suspicious about his past that would have raised any real red flags, except for the only real motive that we have, which kind of circulates the theories section. So three months prior to his death, he was doing surveillance on an underage brothel in the Mission District. And this was owned by a guy named Patrick Roberts. And it was rumored that a lot of cops and city officials were regular customers at this underage brothel. On April 30th, 1988, the brothel was raided. And Lester Garnier was directly involved in this. He was one of the cops involved. 14 people were indicted. Six of the people ran the operation, and eight of them were customers. And two of the most notable customers was a guy named Patrick Miyagishima, who was a cop. And another one was a guy named Roger Boas, who was a local politician. Now, Roger Boas was the chairman of the California Democratic Party. He was the San Francisco chief administration officer for nine years. And the year prior, in 1987, he actually ran for mayor, and he lost. And after this raid, one of the teenage sex workers who worked at the brothel, she recognized Boas from one of his campaign posters. And she said that he was a regular customer there for about three years. And he would always come in and use the name George. So, so he's a dirtbag. Oh, he's a he's a real piece of shit, Deputy X. And just wait until you get to hear their punishments, okay? Boas is charged with 19 counts of statutory rape involving teenage girls. And in October of 1988, he pleaded guilty to seven charges. The other 12 were dropped. Do you want to know what he got, man? Did you read about this part? This is going to make you really mad, Deputy X. Hope you're ready, buddy. He got six months community service and a hundred thousand dollar fine. That's it. Wow. That is it. And on top of that, I'm telling you, man, I'm telling you, dude, when I, when I read that, I was like, are you fucking kidding me right now? I could, I couldn't honestly believe that. I was like, I got to verify this information somewhere else. Maybe these people are lying. Yeah. They weren't lying, man. That's pretty much it. And the cop, Miyagi Shima, he pled guilty to unlawful sex with minor, and he got a one-year suspended sentence, 18 months probation, a $1,000 fine, and he lost his job. That's it. Mm. What do you think about that, Deputy? Oh, man. I, well, you know from previous mm. conversations, my, <laughs> my theory is you got to be above reproach when you're in these kind of positions. And uh, if you get caught doing something like that, man, that's... That's the end. Of, that's the end of the game. I mean, that, there's no coming back from that. So it's not like he was just pocketing some money from a an undercover bust or something. It, you know, that's that's ridiculous. I mean, that's in my opinion, that's death penalty right there. You know, it's pretty messed up, man. Yeah, that is the worst. I mean, yeah, especially, especially for cop, man. yeah, yeah. Cops, politicians, and- anybody, anybody in a public authority figure. You know, going out to these underage brothels, which completely illegal, and then you add in the fact that they're underage, right? Uh-huh. Like that just makes it even worse. But ah, uh, man, yeah, that's ridiculous. It's horrible, and it it's not justice for the for the victims. Even though they could be there by choice, they could be there by sex trafficking, because that's one of the oldest sins known to man. Is it's prostitution and sex trafficking, so... Yeah, for for sure, man. Totally agree. Investigators tried to find some links between Miyagi Shima and uh, 
Garnier, but they they couldn't really find anything, man. There was one time that they might have crossed paths at a stag party, but that was about it, man. And they said at that stag party, uh, Miyagi Shima showed up with two girls who were more than likely from that brothel. But yeah, that was the only vague connection that they could make between him and Garnier besides the the bust obviously because a lot of a lot of the theories you know his murder could have been retaliation for that raid it should also be known that that the Patrick Roberts the guy who owned this brothel he fled right before the raid so a lot of people were saying he was tipped off like he knew it was going to happen he went to Oklahoma and he was captured in Oklahoma the day before Lester Garnier was killed, the investigators tried finding and building these connections between all of them. But the only connection that they had was this raid, which is kind of interesting. I mean, from your perspective as a cop, do you I mean, I personally find it super odd that this dude who owned this brothel that a lot of cops and um, you know, city officials were going to like he flees right before the raid and he, you know, he goes to Oklahoma and then literally captured the, the day before Lester Garnier was killed from your perspective. I mean, would that be the first thing that you think that he was tipped off? Yeah, absolutely. Somebody leaked information they shouldn't have because if you're going to raid something and one, you know, there's other fellow employees and politicians involved, like it's going to be a very select few people. It's going to be very hush hush. And there's that trust amongst your team, right? So if somebody, which, you know, back then they didn't make a lot of money. So it was very possible that someone was paying them for information and they could have been a trusted member of their vice squad that, you know, went back and said, Hey, on this day and time, you need to bounce because they're going to be there. It's a, it's a sad thing, but it still happens today. And some of these larger agencies, information gets leaked to a regular patrolman or something. And then that guy goes and tells people that are, for whatever reason, he's, he's getting a little kickback from them or something. And it's just, yeah. it's unfortunate, but it still happens. I can definitely see that. I could see that being the case. One thing after I after I state this, I am curious about your opinion on this. The San Francisco Police Department ended up having a little bit of a disagreement with the Walnut Creek Police Department because Walnut Creek had the jurisdiction, and they declined help from the San Francisco Police Department, the homicide detectives, which were better trained, more seasoned. I don't want to say more equipped probably to handle something like this, but in Walnut Creek's defense— they had known about this brothel bust and all the factors involved, and they said they declined the help because they they were scared of the corruption factor within the San Francisco Police Department. What are your thoughts on that? Do, is that justified? Do you think that's justified? Yes, absolutely. And we, we can go back to the same thing with the whole Sean Drent case, right? So Sean Drent. They investigated their own Phoenix PD, investigated their own case, right? I totally, that's total BS, man, right? So Walnut Creek's investigating another officer from another agency. I would reject their help too. I'd be like, no, I don't care how sophisticated your equipment is. I don't care how seasoned your officers are. I don't care how much experience and training you guys have. It's one of yours. We don't want your help. I totally respect that. If Walnut Creek wasn't equipped well enough to handle that, they should have brought in somebody from the state outside of that other agency. Like, you can't have an unbiased, truthful investigation if your people are investigating your own department. You just can't do it, you know? And that's, I'm a huge, firm stance. If something were to happen with anybody on any department, in all fairness, state should come in, or if it's, a city agency inside that county, the county should come in and do it. If the county's not equipped, you know, turn it over to the state. And if you have to, bring the feds in, man. Let them do the investigation because it's unbiased. 
especially if the feds send agents from another jurisdiction completely, right? Like, so we have a couple of federal officers from the FBI and the DEA here in our, in our jurisdiction, and they would never, never investigate anything that did anything with our department because we work with them on a regular basis. So there's a bias there, right? Like oh, yeah. we're friends and coworkers on a, on a sense. So bringing somebody from somewhere else, or another agency to do that investigation is perfect. And I, I'm with Walnut Creek on this. No, we, sorry, we don't want your help. We're going to handle this ourselves. But in all fairness for the officer, they should have brought someone from the state or another large agency that could send a couple people out to assist in the investigation. They, I mean, just, just based on the information I've been able to locate, I don't mm-hmm. think Walnut Creek was equipped at that time for that serious of an investigation, but bring in San Francisco in and their their crime scene investigators in to investigate one of their own. I, I don't think is a, is a good call. So I'm with I'm with them on this one. No, we, okay. we don't want your help. So let me ask you guys something. While you're sitting around the house wanting to kill time because you might be quarantined or whatever the case might be, have you thought about trying Audible? Audiobooks are the best. And Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, self-development. Every month, members get one credit to pick any new title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection. And you get access to daily news from the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, And you even get guided meditation programs. To kick off 2020, they are focusing on New Year and New You. They have plenty of content that can help you pursue any of your goals that you might be interested in, whether it's getting back in shape, finishing more books, becoming a better parent, leader, person, whatever the case may be. You can download any of these titles, okay, and you can listen offline anytime, anywhere. You don't even need a signal. The app is free to download and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. You can listen across devices without losing your spot at all. If you can't decide what to listen to, you don't have to worry. You can keep your credits for up to a year and use them to binge on a whole series if you want. It's not a big deal. Personally, my some of my recommendations. As you guys know, I'm a huge history buff, but I'm also a huge mafia buff. I'm into the mob pretty hardcore. I recently got a book called Five Families by Selwyn Rabb. For those of you who are familiar with uh, various documentaries or anything that, that's, that this guy has written, he is so knowledgeable and so good. I mean, this book alone out of 1,600 ratings, four and a half stars. Dude, Selwyn Rab knows what's going on. Another huge one that I uh, recently got into was Gotti's Boys by Anthony DeStefano. For those of you who listened on my Patreon episode about Sammy the Bull Gravano, you know who this dude is. For those of you who listened to my Roy DeMeo episode, you know who this guy is. The freaking book is amazing. And of course, dude, one of my personal favorites and also one of my personal favorite movies is Donnie Brasco by uh, Joseph Pistone, and just so you know, the book has way more details. That's what makes audiobooks so great, and that's what makes Audible awesome, because they have so much. You can just type in a keyword, you know, you can search for any genre you want, and you have all of these selections come up, and the best part is, too, they also have podcasts. They have theatrical performances. They have A-list comedy. They have Audible Originals. They literally have so many books that if you listen to every single title that Audible had, it would take you over 300 years to listen to everything. That's if you played it at normal speed, everything at normal speed. That is freaking insane, and that tells you just how big their collection is. There's really not much to miss out on here. And it's great because you can listen while you're driving, cooking, exercising, gardening, relaxing at home, watching your kids at home while they're not in school right now. 27% of adults say they haven't read a single book in the past year, and that is up almost 10% from 2011. And the main reason is because they don't have time. That's what makes Audible so awesome because you just listen to the books. 
So check this out. If you go to audible.com slash MC podcast, or you can even text MC podcast to 500 dash 500. There you go. Automatically you're in it to win it with audible. In all honesty, like in the month of March and the month of April, there's a good chance we're going to have a lot of free time on our hands. So you might as well pick up an audio book, learn something, read something, be entertained, enlighten yourselves a little bit. There's no excuse of not having enough time anymore because you can listen to Audible anytime. It's so freaking easy. So again, visit audible.com slash mcpodcast, or you can just text mcpodcast to 500-500 and go check it out. So after that, there's the case ends up going cold for about 10 years. And in 1998, the investigation is reopened. Because in November, Internal Affairs does an investigation into a cop by the last name of Repetto. And it's nothing too serious. It's a gambling. Basically, he was betting on sports. And uh, there's a whole Internal Affairs investigation. And this other officer by the last name of Guinan, he basically rounded up all these witnesses to testify against Repetto. But what he told all these other witnesses is that If you, you know, this guy was responsible for the murder of Lester Garnier, like we want to put him behind bars, blah, 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 because Repetto was in the same vice unit at the same time as uh, Lester Garnier, and even the same time as when he died. They were in the same vice unit. Now, Repetto denied any involvement in this, and to be fair, he was never even considered a suspect. So, you know, he ends up, I believe he ended up, uh, you know, losing, losing his job or whatever, you know, that's besides the, the fact, you know, whatever happened with Repetto, because he never really even was considered as, as a suspect. But the interesting thing is in 2002, they had at the time of Lester's death, they had lifted a fingerprint from the top of the passenger side window. And in 2002, they identified that fingerprint. And it couldn't be matched to anyone before that because nobody was in the database. The print had belonged to a woman named Catherine Kuntz. And Kuntz was a Scottish national, and she had moved to the U.S. in 1985 after marrying her husband, who was in the Navy. And in June of 2008, you know, six years later, the cops actually came out and announced that they had matched a print for somebody involved in his death. And the reason they waited six years is because they shipped the print and the information to the FBI. And um, basically they had been looking into her past and stuff like that. And they had been trying to build a case against her for the murder of Lester Garnier. And the reason that it popped up, is because at the time that they announced, you know, they had this match in June of 2008, she was currently at that point in time serving a one year sentence for a probation violation. Now, she had lived in Concord at the time of his death, and she was involved in drugs and sex work as well because her husband was always afloat. You know, he wasn't around much, so she kind of got into. That scene, she ended up becoming addicted to uh, crack cocaine, which, you know, the late 80s, you know, was pretty prevalent everywhere. So 1991, right? The reason her prints were in the FBI database is because in 1991, three years after Lester Garnier's death, she was arrested for conspiracy to commit murder. She had tried to hire two people to kill her husband. And uh, Catherine ended up being acquitted for this because at her trial, her husband testified on her behalf, basically saying, oh, my wife never would have done that. These two people are lying, blah, blah, blah. So they ended up staying married and they moved to Florida and got a divorce the following year in 1992. Now, over the course of the year, she does end up getting married again. Um, but she does get into a little bit of trouble here and there. 
She gets uh, arrested for prostitution a couple times. Mm -hmm. And in 2006, she gets arrested for cocaine possession. She had violated that probation, uh, and that's what she was serving that year in Florida for. And uh, when she was released, as soon as she was released, she was deported. The thing about it was, is even though she matched the description, and like I, that's what I was talking about earlier in the episode, she, she matched this description pretty well of the composite sketch. And her fingerprint was at the scene on the passenger side door or the passenger side window at the top. They had tried three different times to bring up charges on her and have her arrested for this murder, but it never worked because there was at least one other person at the scene. And, uh, you know, everybody believed, obviously, that there's two people involved in this, at least two people, if not three. And they didn't think they could convict her because they they wouldn't be able to prove that she is the one who fired the weapon. And I mean, looking at it evidence wise, yeah, she's at the scene of the crime. I get that. But at the same time, like the evidence man is, is kind of weak for, for a murder case, but that's pretty much why the cops waited that six years until 2008. And they, when they did that, they came out and offered a $250,000 reward for information. All right. And she always denied any involvement in this murder, but she is still the only suspect and probably the, the prime suspect, man. As of now, nobody knows her whereabouts, whether she's still alive or not. Because when she moved back to Scotland, she uh, dropped her married name, took back her maiden name. What are your thoughts on that, Deputy X? I'm pretty curious about that. Well, there was an uncanny resemblance to her booking photo in Florida and the composite sketch from years earlier, right? I'm not a scientist or uh, anything like that, but man, when I saw the composite sketch and her <laughs> photo, booking photo, I was like, ah, that's got to be the same person just yeah. years apart. Like that was the first thing that came to my head, right? And I was like, well problem with the witnesses is neither one of them could positively ID her if they were to see her now. I guarantee you, like, it's just been too long. It was just a quick, I saw this blonde girl in the parking lot kind of thing. But to me, there's an uncanny resemblance. Like, just, oh, for they sure. probably yeah. saw her at the crime scene. Did she do it? I don't, I don't know, man. There's there's so many unknowns and variables here. And let's let's talk about Wester in his promiscuous ways, right? Like he was a ladies yeah, man. He, that's he why was he had the Corvette. Man. He didn't take his guns that night that he was known to carry, right? So, and that would make you think that he's going to meet somebody who he's very comfortable with. Yeah, yeah. So, Pooh, maybe they had had past relations in a way. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but like her just disappearing. I mean, from the the 2008 news release that I saw with the. Uh, the captain from San Francisco there, he, uh, which I, I can't remember his name now, but he, uh, he said, you know, we have people in uh, Europe or whatever it was keeping tabs on her. Well, okay, yeah. great. You're keeping tabs on her, but are you developing that information? Do you know anything else about her or her patterns, her behaviors? There's a lot of unknowns there, but I would say that her fingerprint being at the crime scene, whether it was from a past encounter with Lester or if it was from the night of the murder that needs to be investigated. If I was the detective working that case, man, I, I'd have been like, Hey boss, I need a plane ticket to Florida. I got to go meet with this lady, right? She's incarcerated. It's not yeah, hard to get a face-to-face uh, -face <laughs> with her. You know, you yeah. know, all you got to do is call Florida and set it up. And here we go. We're on a plane. We're going to Florida, which I, I couldn't find anything about whether she had been interviewed while incarcerated or not. Right? I couldn't either. Just, and I had a question too. When you give that kind of information like fingerprints and you give it to the FBI to help investigate, uh, it does that make it a federal case or is it still under – would it still be under Walnut Creek investigation? For Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. 
Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi, said, It is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth, and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer radio show on demand every day, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth. Well, you're not turning over the investigation, right? You're you're seeking assistance. So the primary investigation would still be Walnut Creek Authority, but they're reaching out to the feds who have vast resources that we don't. Mm-hmm. And they're saying, hey, can you just run this through your stuff and give us any feedback you have? You know, it, known aliases, known associate. The feds can tap into her coming into America and going through the visa process and all that so they can see like background information that a regular jurisdiction and agency is not going to have permission, so to speak, to get that. And the federal database is synced throughout, from my understanding, between the FBI, DEA, ATF, Customs, Border Patrol, like they're all synced together in one database, which, you know, as things are progressing in today's society, we're getting more and more information on a daily basis. But back then, when they sent that information over, it was probably just a, hey, can you help us out and get us as much as you have on this one set of fingerprints or this this person that we were looking into, you know? So, and you can you can do that with the with the federal jurisdictions without turning over the entire investigation. Okay. So, so the feds probably could have actually gone to the prison and questioned her or whatever. And I mean, they might have, but I didn't see any information that they did, man. Yeah, it's, it's possible that they could have. It's highly unlikely that they would have sent somebody down to talk to her because it's not a federal case, so to speak. Yeah. Um, now, granted, it is a capital murder case. And mm-hmm. like I said earlier, Walnut Creek should have been reaching out to state or federal authorities from the beginning for assistance with this investigation. Same with Sean Drent. Mm-hmm. Reach out to your resources, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> they, you know, it just, there's so much that, could have gotten overlooked or passed over or lost in the wayside because you got an agency and I don't know much about Walnut Creek, but at the yeah. time from everything I've, I've read, it sounds like they weren't quite equipped to handle this investigation as well as some of the other agencies that they could have reached out to for assistance. Do you have any theory on motive or what might've happened that night? Especially with the well, two phone calls, man, before before he went to meet up with them. Yeah. So let's talk about the two phone calls. So dad supposedly answers the one and it's a woman, mm-hmm. right? He doesn't know much about the conversation because he didn't have that conversation, but he passed the phone off. There's another piece of the puzzle, right? So we've got the phone call from a female. We know for sure. Then a second phone call. I find that too coincidental that he got a phone call from a female, canceled his plans with friends, Mm -hmm. and then was seen by witnesses in the parking lot with a female. And two females, actually, yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, the one witness says, you know, he he only saw the one in the the car. And and the other, the carpet layer saw the two. So we don't know anything about the second female other than she Mm -hmm. was meeting with the one in the same Mm -hmm. parking lot. Correct. But the witness that saw the one getting out of the car, well, that solidifies the phone call, right? He got a call from a female. He obviously went to meet that female. You know, I wish we had some insight on that phone call, man. That would <laughs> that would mm-hmm. answer a lot of these unknowns here. Do you think there's a possibility maybe she was an informant and then 
maybe somebody inside the San Francisco PD might have gotten a hold of her because they knew she was an informant and knew that she could get close to him and said, hey, you know, we know that this is your guy, you know, here's this, you know, get the job done and we'll make sure, you know, nothing comes of it. Do you think that's a possibility? Uh, I I don't know. I mean, it's possible, right? Because let's let's go back to the the big bust with the politicians and other members of the department being involved, right? Mm-hmm. So there was some bad there was some bad blood. He just put some people on the forefront and shut down a place of recreation for them. So maybe there was some bad blood. Maybe now they're not getting their kickbacks from turning a blind eye to something. So they're mad. They're like, hey, this guy caused me these problems I'm having, so I'm gonna take him out. And maybe they did know that she may have been an informant of his or mm-hmm. close enough to get close to him and, and yeah. pull this whole deal off. That's totally plausible. My question that really just is the unsolved answer to this whole puzzle is the other female. Who was she? Yes. Was she yes. San Francisco PD? Was she just another? Uh, was she a madam for these prostitutes? That's mm-hmm. somebody that took a big hurt on this business, right? So they shut down this one brothel, and let's say she was the madam. She was running things like a pimp. Maybe she's looking at a $100,000 a year loss now. In 88, that was a lot of money, man. Maybe it wasn't an internal thing. Maybe it was external, right? He just yeah. pissed off the wrong thing. And that's the thing with these girls that are in this line of work. They will talk to each other more than they will talk to other people yeah you know definitely and so the the girl that was seen getting in his car could have been close enough to have regular contact with him as an informant or you know if he was uh out having you know his playboy activities that he was known for then she could have went back to the madam and been like well i can get i can get you close to him if that's what you want you're messing with people's money man yeah, you, you start messing with people's <laughs> money and people get mad. So that's the absolute truth. And him being a ladies man as well. And that's the thing, though. I mean, he busted a lot of people in that industry up until that point. Like, how could somebody not know that he would potentially be involved in some kind of raid in that area, in that particular business? I'm just kind of throwing ideas out because no matter how you try to connect the dots, for me anyway, there's just so many different things that don't add up, I guess. Just a lot of different scenarios that seem very, very plausible. Yep, yep. So Um, my, my biggest theory on this whole deal, he didn't take the gun because he was comfortable with who he was meeting, and he didn't feel like he needed it. So we have that that known relationship, that comfort Mm -hmm. level, which means that he was being slack in his job or Mm -hmm. he was going for extracurricular activities and this was a regular thing. Yeah. Right. So he goes to meet this known person to him and he gets capped in his car in a parking lot where he probably shouldn't have been in the first place. He's in a whole nother town too, you know? So, like nobody knows him there. Yeah. Uh huh. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So it's interesting. If, if he gets caught doing something in the parking lot he shouldn't be doing, then you know, probably not that big of a deal, right? Because yeah. they're they're not going to know him. And the fact yeah. is, so white he, and badge were in the glove box too, like the car keys too. You know, yeah. Why did with, why did they take the those? car keys? Yeah. Maybe they took the car keys because that's where his house key was. Maybe Very they hard, wanted that really. tape that you talked about. Yeah, for real, man. Yeah. You know. From what I understand, a couple days uh, before his death, he had mentioned to a friend that he was involved in a really big stakeout operation with some fairly known individuals. He never elaborated on that, but it's theorized by a couple people. Obviously, it's not confirmed information or anything that that's might have been what was on that tape. Evidence. If there's discriminating evidence on there. Again, we go back to the not so honest cops that leak information for money. Yep. Somebody somewhere knew 
that, hey, this this is going to burn us all if we don't stop this, Mm -hmm. you know. So they shut it down. And if he was working the case by himself, which is not uncommon from what I understand for, you know, some vice people to go and do surveillance and other things by themselves. Yeah, for sure. And, And until they have enough information to bring other team members in and really, really push a case. But if they're just going on a hunt, sometimes they just do stuff on their own and and then they get some stuff and they're like, oh, hey, I need some help. I need some resources. It's not hard to say that he had been working that by himself because we don't ever see anything else come of that tape and what was exactly. on that tape. Whoever took that tape into evidence might have saw something on there. They're like, well, no, this this, this thing needs to be burnt, right? Like it's going to mm-hmm. it's gonna burn everybody. We need to destroy this, which yeah. again – sometimes you got some not so honest people but let's go back to the parking lot for a minute we have the witness that says he saw the girl get out of the passenger side walk to the driver's side and then disappear into the night Mm -hmm. right doesn't see where she went after that because he was just driving by and then let's look at the crime scene photos that did show up in the news clips in 1988 we see the car taking up a couple spots and that's it we don't see no damaged to the vehicle we don't see you know shattered glass anywhere yeah. in fact if i remember right the one photo showed both windows were down on the car so again we're back to that level of comfort like he knows who he's meeting and where he's meeting them and the urgency of the phone call man i can manipulate the urgency of anything in a phone call to somebody pick mm-hmm. up the phone call whoever i need to call oh man i i listen i got this information i need to get it to you right now like you got to you gotta just, you got to meet me. I, I can't talk about it on the phone. And then you just, right? that's going to pique someone who's investigating something's interest. You know, they're going to yeah, be like, ah, I got to go meet this dude. So I'm thinking that familiarity level there with who he was meeting and the urgency stressed in the phone call is why he just changed plans and went and did what he did. Yeah. And then it was his last venture because, Obviously, we know he was killed that night. Now, that's a good point, though. Like uh, you mentioning that the window's being down and my whole thing with shooting through the back window, like we never, you never saw any shattered glass. There was no report of it anywhere. So it makes you think, you know, whoever was beside him was, if he's comfortable with somebody getting into the passenger side of his car, in that kind of scenario, you know, the comfort level has got to be there. Yeah. And maybe Catherine was the one that got in the vehicle, you know, cause mm-hmm. like Definitely. You said, she, she had a storied past with some of these charges, yes. which is up the alley of his investigation. So let's say she's the one that got in the car and shot him. There's just so much missing for a good conviction. That's why they didn't, take her from Florida and expedite her back to California for trial or anything because they didn't have enough to convict, but she is a solid suspect because, you know, I I thought that was funny. You brought up the top of the window with the fingerprint, right? Like, yeah. If the windows were down in the Corvette, in my theory, her fingerprint would have ended up on top of the window by grabbing the door to open or close it. Exactly. And even if that, even if that window's up like an inch or a half inch, when she gets in and out of that car, that's where her hands are going to be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the things I really thought was interesting was um, I watched uh, one of the the videos that's out there from uh, interviews and uh, Detective uh, Jerry Whiting from yeah Walnut Creek Police Department said that this was an extremely cold blooded killing. So. Again, what makes him? What money. makes him say that? Yeah. What? Why? Did, why does he think this was extremely cold blood? You know. Yep. But when you look at the the things that this that Lester was investigating, you know, prostitution rings and drugs and other things that he would have been doing as a vice cop. And that you're huge messing, raid. You're messing with you? Yeah. Yeah. That huge raid that had politicians and other officers involved. You're messing with people's livelihoods. You're messing with people's money. Mm-hmm. And. and Somebody somewhere is going to be mad about it and want you dead. Was it someone on his own department or was it someone in that sleazeball world of criminals that wanted him dead? Yeah. You know, and I, sure. I, w- I wish 
I wish that I had an insider over at, at, at SFPD to, to reach out to him and be like, hey, I, I need some more information on this case, man. But oh, I, man. I don't have any contacts <laughs> over there. Any little bit of information, dude, would be exponential at this point because what we have is what we have. And, I mean, it's it's a, various sources, you know, but it's all the same small bits of information. And like I said, the, the bullet trajectories – and where the wounds, where the entry wounds of the two bullets were, I'm really curious to know that. And one, there was one article that I read that said the shot to the stomach was the first one. And it kind of made me think, it's like, well, how do they know that unless his body was slumped over forward for the second shot and the trajectory was more behind the head? But then again, that's just pure speculation on my behalf. But when I read that they knew the first shot was in the abdomen, I was like, I, you know, I only read that in one source too. That, that was the thing. I'm like, how do they fucking know that? You know, but I guess if, if, if the trajectory of the, of the headshot, I guess would have been more in the back. I could see that being the, the scenario because, you know, you get shot in the gut, you're going to clinch over, you know, you're going to, you're going to double over. And then somebody put one in the back five o'clock or, you know what I'm saying? Like not exactly directly mm -hmm. at three o'clock in the temple or in the side of the head. But, you know, I wish I could have confirmed that information from a couple other sources, but unfortunately that was not the case. Well, let's, let's theorize on this for a second, right? So you got somebody with a pocket gun sitting in the passenger seat that you're comfortable with being around. Let's emphasize the pocket gun. That is a, it's an AMT 380, which is usually a police side piece. Not just any pocket gun, but I, because I thought that was very interesting too. Well, yeah, it was, it was a common backup weapon because of its size and caliber mm -hmm. and it was semi-auto. So it's not a two-shotter, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, it's extremely odd that they had the same pistol that's commonly used amongst that department as a backup piece mm -hmm. right i had never heard of an amt until you, you <laughs> asked me to do this one with you and i was like AMT. <laughs> well they said it was an extremely rare one and i was like what's so fucking rare about a 380 and then i saw amt and i'm like what the hell is that yeah it's there wasn't a lot of them in production and they just weren't as common as some of the other brands out there you know so mm -hmm. but being that most of his department, well, I shouldn't say most, there was only like 10 or 12 officers that actually had them from mm -hmm. his department. But who's to say a couple other people didn't have some throwaway guns from other things they had dealt in, you know? Very true. I mean, if you got a dirty cop, you got a dirty cop, man. And they're they're going to have throwaway gonna keep, guns. Yeah, they're going to have things like that. So it's clean, can't be traced back to anybody. We're going to send it with this girl. She's going to take care of this problem for us. It's done. I mean, I, I hate to say that there's dirty cops out there. Like, you know, me being in that profession, I hate <laughs> to say that. I really do. There's dirty but people what? in every profession, man. You know what I mean? It's just you guys, yeah, but between you and, like, whether it be politicians or police officers or even famous people like celebrities, there's always going to be a few bad apples, man. You know, it's just your guys' exactly. is more publicized than – most other people because you're supposed to be the good guys <laughs> you know it's like uh, above um, reproach man exactly yep so you know she's she's in the passenger seat she's got on a business skirt or i mean because every every video reenactment thing that i was able to find they were supposedly dressed in like business skirts and suit jackets i'm like mm -hmm. okay i don't i don't know how accurate this really is but exactly because i never you know. heard any kind of description on clothes from any of the witnesses but the reenactments i no. saw were the same thing i was like well maybe this fucking lady you know the act you know the producer or director was like hey come on over here real quick walk to this car <laughs> let me film it well and, and it was 1988 i mean people did dress a little a little different back then you know you had the the whole Sport coat and blue jean thing was real popular back oh, hell yeah, in, in the late eighties. So the members only jackets too, bro. I mean, yeah, looking, just, looking good, you know. <laughs> it's totally plausible <laughs> that she was in some something like that. 
Yeah, it is. Or at least had some kind of pocket somewhere where she could conceal it. Right. Because that that would be my thing, though. That would be my thing, though. Like what kind of person who is known to be addicted to crack cocaine and known to be a sex worker and known to be into hardcore drugs is going to wear a fucking business like skirt suit, man? Like, is that, you know, I mean, is that a possibility? I mean, granted, like you said, back in the 80s, definitely, definitely different. So I suppose it would be a possibility. I'm going to say yes, it's a possibility, right? Like. You know, culturally, that was it was more common to wear attire like that. And yeah. depending on the clientele they were dealing with, yeah. and hell, you could put a three a little more high end, like a high, high stocking too, man. Like even on the inside of your yeah. thigh, you could pocket one right in there. Yeah, and well, and you know, this is kind of what I'm leaning towards here is that she had on some kind of coat, jacket, something, mm-hmm. where she had it in her, she had it in her pocket. Yeah, And she literally just shoots through her clothing. The first shot catches him in the gut, pulls it out, mm-hmm. puts one in his head. And that would, also, that would also explain why the other casing wasn't found because it ejected in her pocket. Oh, shit. Right? That's a good point. So, I mean, if I was going to execute somebody okay. sitting in the passenger seat of their car, I'm going to pull that first round from my clothing <laughs> and then I'm going to pull it out and finish the job. So the gut shot, then the head shot would explain multiple factors in this theory is she shot from within her clothing the first shot. That's why she hit him in the gut because she wasn't really aiming. And that's why we can't find the other casing. And then second shot is out in the open to the head. Casing falls in the car or outside the car somewhere where it was located at. And then you just get up and you walk away. That's that's very good. My whole thing is though, if if she's professional enough to put that second shot in his head to know to get that kill shot right there, which granted, you know, you want somebody dead, you're gonna more than likely put one in, in their head. Why wouldn't she do a revolver? Because there's no shell casings left with a revolver. And like I don't want to say most professionals, but just because of like mob related episodes I've always done. That's that was always their thing. A lot of the times was they would use revolvers because it never left any shell casings behind. Like Sammy the Bull Gravano, that was his big thing. He's like always use a revolver on a hit, you know, because you never yeah. leave shell casings. But I don't know. I honestly, that's very very plausible. If she was wearing a jacket. That could definitely explain like why only one shell casing was found. And I tried so hard, dude, to find another source. That said, there were two shell casings found, but I only saw that there was one. Yeah, I mean, and and here's here's another thing to consider, right? She was given the gun prior to the meetup. So somebody just handed her one and said, here, it's clean. Just don't leave it behind. Exactly. You know, if I was going to plan an execution, I'm going to make sure that I wipe all my casings. Even with today's technology, it's extremely hard to pull a usable a casing. Yeah, usable fingerprints. Okay. You can get partial, but pulling a good usable print from a casing, the smaller the casings are, the harder it is. Oh yeah. And then you have the whole uh propulsion and explosion, the rapid temperature changes that cause different things. I was actually talking to one of my detectives about this not too long ago because I had a case where a casing was left behind in someone's yard and I was like, hey, can we try and get prints off this? And he's like, no, man. He's like, it, it, it's useless. He's like, we might get a partial, but we're not going to get anything usable. It's not it's not worth the time or the resources to even try. Okay. Like, all right. So, you know, the bigger the casings are, I'm sure there might be more yeah, usable sure. stuff off of them. But especially a 380, that's a tiny little cartridge. Oh, it's yeah. powerful, yeah. but it's, it's small. Yeah, definitely. Because I've had I've had instances where I'm out uh, on a hot summer day shooting, uh, you know, a 1911, and I've had it to where it was hot enough outside, and after three or four rounds, repetitively, you know, like a second or two apart, after about three or four rounds, because of the sun and because of how hot it is, and I know this was at nighttime, but uh, it, it would jam. It would still fire that. It would still fire that round. But when it went to eject the cartridge, it would jam back and the cartridge would actually get stuck in the chamber on its way out. 
even though it just mm-hmm. got done firing. So like I was sitting there thinking, I'm like, well, this is mid July. And I, I mean, granted it's Northern California, but you know, there's still gotta be some kind of heat, but only after two rounds. I mean, I personally don't see that as a possibility. I mean, do you, mm-hmm. what do you think? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to say that that's probably not okay. the, the reason why it's plausible. Right. I mean, it, especially if somebody was loading these things themselves, which, Hitmen were known to do this thing where they would load rounds and they would not fill them with as much powder so they weren't as loud, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, for sure. But you had to, you you had would to have guarantee to... your shot, you know? Well, that would make you straight up like you would have to load your own cartridges at that point, wouldn't you? You would have to. Yeah. 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 It makes sense, yep. though. And that's. And that's what I was saying, like like people that do hand loading, if they don't put the exact amount of powder in there, you can have ejection issues too. And it was common. I mean, there's another podcast we both listen to about mob people and stuff. And oh yeah, they yeah. Uh, they talk about that where they wouldn't load them hot enough, and they'd have a malfunction after mm-hmm. one or two shots. So it's plausible that that's the case is is it was an actual hit man that gave her the gun and said, you can get close enough. Everything's clean. Just don't leave the gun behind or whatever. And she got in there, did what she had to do and she left. Or my other thought is that she shot from her pocket and the casing just stayed inside the the pocket. And then she pulled it out for shot number two to to Mm -hmm. make sure that he died putting that round in his head. And then that's when the casing disappeared and she couldn't find it or she didn't think to find it she just popped pop and it. let's take off and get out of here yeah because she was told it, think- was a, it was a clean gun and it's like listen just get it done the first shot incapacitate them second one's kill shot yeah especially i mean who's not gonna freak out getting shot in the gut from the person sitting next to you like that that's just totally gonna shock the senses right there and then oh, you're gonna yeah. be like uh so yeah. I'm leaning towards the fact that this this Catherine Kuntz knows way more, had should have at least been brought in for questioning before deportation, or mm-hmm. had been interviewed. But I mean, they could be withholding that information too because they do know who the killer is. They just don't have enough solid evidence to convict yet. So very true. You know, that's another thing that we do in law enforcement is we sit on information until it goes to prosecution because there's only three people that are going to know that the investigators, the suspect and any close witnesses that may have been involved, right? They may not be the suspect, but they were involved enough that they might know some of that information. So Mm -hmm. we're going to withhold that from the press and the public knowledge. And then when it goes to trial, that will all come to light then at trial. But maybe, and maybe that's why they let her go. Maybe she Maybe they did interview her and she did have enough. She had some information because I remember that the one captain during his interview on the that news clip, he said that they had they didn't have enough information to convict, but she was a solid suspect and that yeah. they deported her back. And then she was still being followed by their European counterparts, you know. Yeah. So and, may, and maybe that's the deal is Interpol maybe or she whatever. gave them a little bit. Well, maybe she gave him a little bit of information. I mean, like I said, I couldn't find where they had actually gone and interviewed her. Mm-hmm. But maybe they did, and she gave him enough information to look for another suspect. Or maybe she told him to pound sand, and they had nothing. So that's why it's not there to be found, because they didn't get anything from her. Yeah. So she's still considered a suspect. But there's got to be. I mean, with today's technology, the advancements in technology and fingerprinting and DNA, And the fact that they still had the car in secure storage back in the early 2000s when this technology was really hitting the market. Yeah. And they, you know, obviously they were able to go and pull another fingerprint that they didn't have before. So, you know, they could be sitting on some really good information and either they can't find the suspect or the suspect's dead. um, And they can't really say that they did it without some kind of interviewing or a couple other falling into place so it's just sitting as a cold case right now it's still a super unfortunate that uh lester garnier lost his life um you know it it always sucks when somebody loses their life in an unfortunate circumstance but it really 
sucks for me like when it's another police officer even though this is back in the day before my time so I, I think I was like one and a half when this happened but you know still <laughs> it still sucks historically like cops getting killed in the line of duty or off duty it's still you know to me that it's got a I got a, I got a little bit of a different remorse for that because yeah. it's unfortunate but no totally agree well deputy x i can't thank you enough again man for joining us i'm glad uh like i said man your insight on cases like this is pretty invaluable <laughs> so and i know my listeners enjoy having you on too so yeah no i absolutely enjoy it and hopefully things will work out and i'll uh i'll be able to bring a, a case from from my side of the line that that's kind of piqued my interest hey, soon. Anytime, and, uh, dude. Anytime. Hopefully, it won't be much longer, and I'll uh, I'll be able to get. They're going to be redacted, but at least I'll be able to get the the file. That's um, fine, and I'm pretty sure I know which one you're talking about as well. Oh um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. We've we've talked about it, and I yep. uh, I I talked to the lead detective the other day about possibly getting a redacted file because you know like i said there's information that can always be released to the public even 30 yeah. years later so yeah that's understandable you know? <laughs> but yeah as as always it's been a pleasure i appreciate you reaching out and and having me on and i look forward to the next one hell yeah man well on that note i suppose dude pleasure was all mine and till the next time man i'll talk to you later all right justin take care man yeah you too man Oh, welcome, welcome everybody to the reviews section. First, we're going to start off with America. We have Guitar Picker 61, five stars, Larry Bentley. Absolutely phenomenal. Hathcock was the man. Did you run across another nickname that I heard for him? The Rooster, also a reference to his feather. That's pretty badass right there, man. Larry Bentley, you are uh, fucking awesome. And... By God, if I don't greatly appreciate that five-star review, because right here we have a one-star review from Group Worker. It says one star, terrible. He talks like a high school kid, very unpolished and unprofessional. I don't know, I think I'm doing pretty fucking good here, Group Worker. I wonder what kind of groups you work anyway. Yeah, you know who else was uh, unpolished and unprofessional? <laughs> Your mom still left her a three-star review on back pages, though, because she had soft hands and could take her teeth out. <laughs> oh, savages everywhere, fucking idiot. Listen to more than five minutes of one episode I did four years ago, then come talk to me, dipshit. Yeah, and quit leaving a review. Yeah, I saw your other reviews for other podcasts, too. Fucking left a bad review for the podcast Autopsy. This fucking group worker literally was like, quit stating facts, facts that are absolutely obvious. So you're a group worker and a fucking coroner? Medical examiner? Get the fuck out of here. This one's from JB143, five stars, love it. Been listening to various episodes, and so far I've loved the in-depth research Justin produces. It's great to see both sides of a story presented from a fairly neutral viewpoint. Loving the Gunny Hathcock episodes, an absolute legend from our beloved core. Keep it up, Devil Dog, Semper Fi. That's what I'm fucking talking about right there, man. Love that shit. Um, yeah, dude, Hathcock was the fucking man, and as you know as well as I do, that guy is a legend in the core, man. Legend in the core. Next one we got from Raider. 65807 says, nice and concise. Uh, this podcaster can do it all. He can give a synopsis when the storyline with... He can give a synopsis, then the storyline with the unvarnished facts. Jesus, man, I've had a couple beers, sorry. <laughs> storyline with the unvarnished facts to... to to conclusion in a nice beat in a nice neat bundle then you decide what what to believe okay in my defense some of that was misspelled so i'm all right but uh no that's the best the best part raider it's it's not my job to you know 
uh, sway you either way or the other. I try to try my hardest to stay middle of the road and just give the facts and you guys decide what you want. You know, I think that's the way I think that's the way, especially in the true crime history genre. I think it's important to do that shit, even in paranormal, for fuck's sake. Uh, so I'm glad you appreciate that, man. This one is from Aiden, Aiden Sean or Aidenson. I think it's Aiden Sean. Uh, five stars says amazing show. Great job. The research is top notch and I really enjoy the show. Keep up the fantastic work. You know what? I'm going to try my fucking best. I appreciate that immensely. Actually here in about one month, I'll be celebrating four years. So I'm going to try my hardest to make it another four. We'll see. See who kills me before we get there. <laughs> um, what do we got here? Uh, says uh, L. Donaldson. Really love this podcast. I've listened to three of the four Carlos Hathcock episodes. What a guy. The podcast is well researched and the host keeps you interested. Yes, he does use some bad language, but it's not over the top. Thank you very much. I do greatly appreciate that. Uh, you know, some episodes I curse more than others, and that's just the way it is. Um, you know, sometimes I get excited. This one's a good one. It's from Spalding67. Three stars. Interesting, but... I don't mind this podcast. I didn't mind this podcast initially. Some good episodes, good stories, okay delivery. But the host reached a new level of moron in part three of the Harlow... Carlos Hathcock story. Not a fan anymore. Too too much excited tough guy adulation and overuse of the F word in adolescent fashion. And and insult the listener whom he assumes is afraid of a modern military draft situation? Uh, no. Alright. First of all, I didn't even drop the F-bomb that much in that episode, so you need to fucking... Lift up your skirt and grab your fucking balls, dude. All right? If you even are a guy. I don't know. You're probably a girl, I imagine. I don't know. I love all the huge fucking big words. Tough guy adulation. Using the F word in adolescent fashion. You know what? Carlos Hathcock was a fucking tough guy. And yeah, I admire that motherfucker for it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Pretty sure you fucking, you know, you're probably wishing you, first of all, I was almost going to let, the, I was going to let this slide. I was going to let this review slide. I was going to read it, but I wasn't going to get savage on it until you told me I've reached a new level of moron. And here's, I'm going to point out a couple of things just so we're on the same level of fucking moron here. Okay. First of all, if you have the observation skills of Stevie fucking wonder and that's no offense to Stevie Wonder because, you know, I love that guy. I love his music. He's an amazing musician who's been a musician for a long time. Amazing musician. Okay, but Spalding67, I just called to tell you, fuck you. Okay, anybody who caught that reference there is awesome in my book. I never, if, if you have... If you have any fucking observational skills whatsoever, if you remember that little thing with fucking Iran, you know, I don't know how many months ago, it was like six months ago or some bullshit, and then we had that whole thing with North Korea, if you have social media, if you are around any kind of young people what the fuck soever, or if you hear people talking when you leave your fucking, uh, you know, your, your fucking little hermit hole, then yeah, you saw and heard... The younger crowd of people talking about a fucking new draft. Trust me, here's the deal. I could give a fuck less if they did it, okay? <laughs> I would fucking volunteer, just like a bunch of badasses. Whether you're scared of it or not, I don't fucking know. Judging from this, probably, okay? Judging by how sensitive you got about an F word and that me saying that in that episode... Obviously, you're a pretty sensitive motherfucker. All right, so I'm pretty sure you were one of those people who was scared of a fucking draft. I never said it was going to happen. Trust me, it will never fucking happen. We have enough volunteers, okay? We don't need a fucking draft. We will never have another fucking draft. Don't get me wrong. It would probably help a couple motherfuckers out in this world right now. You know, some of these young folks out here, and I'm not bashing all young folks, so all you 21-year-olds who listen to the fucking show, don't be emailing me, well, I'm fucking young, blah, blah, blah. Listen, 
Like, I get it, okay? But anybody who can view the fucking world with a set of eyes or listen to what's going on, trust me, some of these motherfuckers need a couple years in the military, all right? Toughen their fucking asses up a little bit. You know, maybe learn what fucking life's really about. Maybe travel the world a little bit. And then when they come home, they can really see how good they actually fucking have it. I think that would help a lot of people out these days, to be perfectly honest with you. And just because of this review, I actually took a poll in my group. I straight up posted. I didn't even post your review in there because I didn't want people fucking hunting you down and, you know, giving me more ammo to fucking, you know, shoot at you with here, you know, when I'm making fun of you and all kinds of shit. But all I did was ask, was anybody else offended by me mentioning the fucking, you know, people being scared of a modern day draft in part three? And you are the only fucking person who apparently was offended by this shit. And you are the only fucking person who apparently thinks I reached a new level of moron by saying, hey, you know, if you haven't noticed anything going on around you, like, get a fucking life, brah. Like, get a fucking life. And to be perfectly honest with you, I am pretty sure because of that Carlos Athcock episode... Um, all I got were reviews from the U.S. that time. So, yeah, apparently for some odd reason, iTunes, uh, UK is not coming up at the moment. Um, Australia is no new shit from there. And Canada, no new shit from there either. So, thank you all very much for taking the time to leave those reviews. It is greatly appreciated. And, um, yeah, I suppose I'll see you guys next time. This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up the... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there at HRT in 2015, me and certain liquors don't mix, don't mix well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And... Because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts.